Yo, everybody. Welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics brought to you by Sketch.com. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the artist of the upcoming Aquaman Andromeda for DC Black Label and the writer of the upcoming Bloodstained Teeth at Image. It's Christian Ward. Thanks for coming on, Christian. Hello. Thank you for having me, David. I've uh, been a fan of yours for a long time, so thrilled to be here. How is nighttime in England? Is it nice and true? Is Shrewsbury, right? Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury, yeah, it's very dark at the moment. We've got two storms having a battle. It's a bit like Godzilla versus uh, King Kong outside. So they're literally, these two storms are like clashing against each other. The winds were so bad. There was this guy that runs a, a, an aviation YouTube channel and he talks of any, and it, normally he's like, he has like 100 followers. And today he had like 300,000 followers because he was basically live kind of commentating on these planes trying to land, wobbling in the sky, desperately trying to kind of get down safely. Whoa. That was the UK today. O2, the big dome. The roof's been blown off that. It's been pretty wild. Actually, I think I was just looking at your Twitter and I think I saw somebody in London who like people were walking around and literally getting blown over. Literally. That's insane. You've got all these people saying, oh, it's just a bit of wind. You're like, no, just stay indoors. What's wrong with you? Just stay indoors. We have the very excellent combination right now. We got a ton of snow here in Anchorage, Alaska for like a week. And then all of a sudden it jumped up to like 38 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So above freezing. Wow. And then it dropped to freezing. And now everything is like an ice rink and disgusting. And so oh my, God. my wife told me, don't go driving. And then I almost got stuck in our own driveway. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I should stay home. <laughs> my wife's Canadian. So she, so she really misses that whole big snow. We don't have big snow here. We have dustings. She misses the big snow. I feel like that's one of those things that you miss until you enjoy again, in which case you're like, I don't yeah. miss it anymore. But anyways, let, let's get into some comic stuff. I do want to to bring up, you know, you had a big week between Aquaman Andromeda and, uh, you know, being announced and your Three Worlds, Three Moons story transit dropping. I know. How did uh, the announcement day for Aquaman go? It sounded like you were feeling quite the buzz last night from the response. Oh, it was amazing. Oh, I love it. It always happens whenever you get a big book announced. Because I've seen that when you work on a kind of book and as an artist or a writer, and both in my case, um, you've got your deadlines and you tend to get your deadlines and you break them up into weeks and you break the weeks up into days. You go, okay, well, today I've got to do X number of pages or X number of pages in my script. And I never, ever think, oh, but that's going to be the announcement day. So I'm going to be sat on Twitter, refresh refresh and then just replying i never i never remember it and it's the same thing for when the first issue comes out of any book you work on you'd never you never work on that day because you i mean at least for me you're obsessed and you're refreshing and you're going you you know you you put in your comic into the search bar and and just searching for it so yeah yesterday was for my editors was probably quite frustrating because i didn't do as much work as i probably should have done but for me it was amazing I mean, it was really, I mean, I would say Aquaman by far is the most buzziest of all the things I've been involved with. But I kind of I kind of knew it would be. Yeah. You know, you got your Black Label, you've got Aquaman, you know, and obviously, you know, the last film was such a big hit and new films coming out this year. So there's a real buzz anyway about that character, you know, and then add to the mix, you know, Ram, who's, you know, just rising, rising, rising and has these really interesting takes on these characters that everyone thinks they know. And he had such an interesting take on that. I also knew that obviously last year, the year before, time is wibbly wobbly, so I'm, I can't remember. I got the Eisners for the um, for Invisible Kingdom. So I knew this was, even though I've done a few bits and pieces between then and now, this was like my next series. So I knew there'd be a little bit more attention on that. So it's, all those things have kind of collided it's been fantastic. Brilliant. I just did this big feature on this comic Dirtback Rapture at Oni. And one of the things I talked to people about, it was basically how a comic gets made from concept to release day. I asked specifically about like, you know, what is release day like? And it's interesting to see because it seems like it's pretty much impossible to not pay attention to it. If all goes to plan, it's like the type of thing that is going to energize you going forward it doesn't always go to plan but it sounds like in this case or at least for release day for you it all went to plan oh yeah i've been very fortunate that all the collaborators i've ever worked with have always been you know really amazing so that 
I've always had really good launch days and, and, you know, the books have always been well received, you know, most part because you know, my collaborators have just been amazing. And the books that they've been, the book that they've, they've kind of created with me as, you know, they brought it to a, a, a much higher level. You, you know, you always have a little bit of trepidation, mm-hmm. but um, so far, touch wood, you're always going to get some people that don't like it. Right. And you're always going to get some people that hate it. But I actually, I quite like that in mm-hmm. a weird way. If you're doing something, and especially with my work, which is quite idiosyncratic and, and not necessarily superhero mainstream, let's say, the fact that somebody hates it, and it's not often, but sometimes it happens, is a passionate response. And you always want to have a passionate response. Ideally, you want the love. So, you know, when you do get the odd review here and there, and it's like, oh, my God, this is the worst thing I've ever seen, it tends to not bring me down. Yeah. What brings me down is if you get, you know, lots of middling indifference. Exactly. And so luckily it's mostly love with a few drops of hate and I can I can deal with that. That's um that feels like a good mix to me. I feel like the history of superhero comics is loaded with titles that people responded very negatively to when announced or when it was kind of first revealed. And then eventually they're like, this is the comic I didn't know I always wanted. I'm not going to lie. I'm not generally a big Aquaman guy, but I do love the idea of reframing the story around the idea of like a horror story. Because frankly, this is me. This is me. I spent a lot of time on open water in my life. I find the deep sea to be horrifying. It's like, it's really scary. It's super unknown. It's dark. It's cold. If you get lost out there, you're hosed. There's so many creatures you don't even know about. I mean, yeah. I, it's it, like one of the first things I thought of when I saw that you all were doing a horror story was um, not to talk about another comic, but it was uh, Peter Milligan and S.I. Ribich's uh, mm-hmm. Submariner of the Depths. And that was great because it really tapped into the terror that comes with it because it's so unknown. And like, I, I feel like obviously you all are seemingly doing something a little bit different because you described it to me as like a there's like a cosmic vibe to it. At the same time, though, I think the, the the roots are still there. I'm not like I said, not big Aquaman guy, but I'm like totally in on that just because I weirdly like things that kind of freak me out. I think a lot of people are like that, though. Horror movies are huge. Yeah, no, and it, and it will. It absolutely will. I mean, like the and the first script, I mean, I'm almost finished on on issue one. So it's crazy. So it's just been announced. And I'm already a third of the way through. And it's it's a great, I don't want to give too much away. And, and you know, it's not my place to sort of talk about Ram's story. But there's a great balance between genuine psychological drama and tension with more kind of cosmic stuff that's going on. And as the story continues, those two things are going to kind of white sort of be twirled together. I mean, it's, it's quite Lovecrafty. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the best way I can kind of describe it. Um, but it's it, growing up, underwater horror was 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 my jam, and I don't know why. Um, like I remember watching Aliens, like a lot of us did as a teenager, and I I kind of went from that into the abyss, and then I suddenly it was it was the idea of of underwater to me felt as cool and as exciting, and sometimes maybe even more exciting than space oh yeah i'm with you so so, you know there was all those leviathan was another one there was loads that just follow each other and they're all like kind of underwater monsters and i looked all them sphere and then more recently there was underwater with uh chris stewart and even when they're not great there's just something about it that's just like you know really cool so when they brought this to me it was crazy how much it fit for me because like you I, i'm not an aquaman fan in fact I, I think i'd be hard pressed to think of an aquaman comic that i've read but when they brought it to me it, it just felt so perfectly aligned with my interests and what i felt was a good fit for me visually that it, and obviously working with ram it was a very difficult thing to say no to yeah and, and but what was quite interesting when it when it was offered to me I was already kind of not fully committed to something else, but I had something else kind of like coming together with another writer. And and there was a lot of agony for me because, you know, when you go through kind of the industry, like any industry, you kind of want to treat people right. You want to be kind of thought of as somebody who's bored and not going to kind of mess people around. And it, it kind of really bothered me that I didn't want to kind of let this other person down because we had had these conversations about doing this thing, but I just couldn't, I couldn't let go 
of Aquaman. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, and, and I was trying to think, oh, you know, and I was doing this thing was, going, oh, it's just Aquaman, isn't it? It's just Aquaman. Maybe I should just <laughs> do this other thing. You know, I'm not an Aquaman fan, but it just it wouldn't let go. It was like a tentacle around me. Yeah. I knew it would make me happy. Do it. And I've always, as a big DC fan, I love Marvel. I'm not the sort of person that's like Marvel or DC. Yeah. And there are characters in both that I really adore. But I would say out of the two, DC resonates with me more. Sure. And it's more aligned with with kind of my sensibility. So I've always wanted to do a DC book. And then when they started doing Black Label, it felt it felt like the perfect place that I was like, I could do what I do there. I don't have to fit into a kind of like a a different hole. I can be me and just be me in that universe and kind of do my interpretations of of, of these characters that I love. Mm-hmm. So it was it was just me when I got the email from the editor. I was just like, wow. But it took me. I mean, it must have been two weeks for me to give them the answer, and they were fantastic with me. You know, and they were really, and they were obviously everyone, Ram included, were really keen for me to do it, which is always really lovely to have that desire and, and, and you know, because it gives you a, a lovely sense of, of confidence in yourself. Um, so thankfully, yeah, I, I sort of, yeah, I, I dived in. Yeah, there you go. And I'm so, so happy that I did. And it's, you know, when I read that first script, it was so good. And it's funny because um, they've released quite a lot of the, the big images from the first issue, you know, your, your big selling points. And as fun as all that kind of scary kind of like, you know, monster stuff is to draw, it's Ram's character interaction and his his um, attention to psychological detail that is really fun. Mm-hmm. You know, I really love that when I'm drawing stories. And I love that in my own, like when I do my own writing, just to sort of um, really think about how characters connect or how they don't connect. And Ram's really great at that. So his scripts have just been filled of, of lots of drama that's just been really fun to sort of put on the page. And um, I think it has the potential to be one of the best things I've done so far. So I'm really, really excited. You know, one thing that I think that Rom is very good at is like tapping into like primal feelings. And like, I feel like... yeah underwater stuff just based off what we talked about is really loaded with that i do think it's interesting though because when i think of your art i think of your colors almost almost first because like you have like a a particular way of coloring yourself there's like a lot of vibrant colors maybe not okay vibrant might not be the right word but there's a lot of bold colors in there and i think that's interesting because there's kind of two ways you could kind of approach coloring an underwater book there's what Esad did where it's like I think in if, if I remember in that book in uh, Submariner of the Depths he kind of leaned into the darkness as like mm-hmm. almost uh, making it feel claustrophobic as he was drawing it and his, yeah. as he was coloring and everything or there's and that's like the more literal approach or leaning into the darkness of it you know when you were kind of developing like the look of the book again famously dark very very deep underwater did the setting affect how you thought of the colors or is it more just about like what the story needs oh yeah both obviously colors as you pointed out is what i do but that doesn't necessarily mean it always has to be bright right that just means that's what's been done before right for whatever i've done before that being said you know i looked for places that i could inject more color and touches of psychedelia in a way that was relevant for the story and in context with the story and i think as the story goes on that there'll be more chances to to sort of do to play around with color as we kind of like go more into the kind of horror of it Mm -hmm. one trick that i did so that it would have those colors was was aquaman's suit the coral armor yeah i just i mean it was just it was a bit of a light bulb moment i i knew that i wanted to have his suit almost be like kind of like a biological armor ram had this thing where he he um we were talking about it and ram said i kind of saw him as a statue sort of standing you know be just still because i'd send i'd sent him the these designs with like little bits of coral on them uh, and then obviously ram wanted to kind of like you know he that took him onto the statues and then um it was wanting to then just go really go with that and just make that the kind of thing that made our act man uh, Aquaman it was, and it was a way of kind of having a little bit of the a little bit of the orange so that we know and a little bit of the kind of the green 
And I had this idea that the orange would be slightly kind of, you know, when cop goes green, there's that element. So the idea that it's it was armor at one point, um, more like kind of like a, a medieval armor. Mm-hmm. So we're really look, looking at that king sort of aspect of it. But then the coal was a way that I could be like, well, I love drawing organic forms and I love splashes of color and I love using complementary colors in unusual ways, even if it's just a little splash here, a little splash there. Like I'll often put just a single dot of a complementary color amongst other colors just to sort of set them off. And it was it was a way putting that coal on was a way of sort of allowing me license to do that and, and have for want of a better expression, kind of my signature kind of look in there somewhere. Mm-hmm. But it's been fun to sort of colour in a different context because as I look, I mean, I've got the vast majority of the first issue kind of on my desktop here, all little kind of laid out as little thumbnails. And and obviously I'm not seeing the details when I look at it from this distance. All I'm seeing is the kind of like the colour. And it's the bluest book I've ever done, as you would expect. I mean, mm-hmm. It's really, really blue. But there's there's real darkness to it, and then there's you know changes of this colour. And I mean, it's quite a sombre story. And when I say it's a sombre story, that doesn't mean it hasn't got drama. It doesn't mean it hasn't got tension. And it doesn't, you know, you you can see when you read the first issue, it's going to open up into quite an exciting story. Ram's kind of code name for this project was Project Pressure, mm-hmm. and that's definitely what this what the characters are going through both psychological emotional and obviously physical with 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 the um the atmosphere so there's there's a sense in this first issue of foreboding and it's been really nice to kind of do that with the colors and do something quite foreboding and almost quite gothic Mm -hmm. lots of darkness and shadows and kind of shafts of light trying to break through the darkness um and obviously it's set in a place that's a real place that's where there, there is no life as the story goes on, it starts off. And there's little splashes of colour again, with the sort of fish flying, that sort of swimming around, flying. Uh, and as the story goes on, an issue progresses, and they get further, further into this this place where there is nothing. It gets darker and, and greyer, and but it's quite cool. It's quite cool to do something different and, yeah. and actually lean more on textural stuff um, and light. It's interesting hearing you talk about it. It actually kind of reminds me of, you know, you just worked on uh, a Three Worlds, Three Moons story. And one thing I've really enjoyed about that whole process is seeing Mike Huddleston and Mike Del Mundo's um, kind of breakdown of their process. And there was this whole section that Del Mundo did that where he shared his designs for how this character could have survived on this world using organic matter to kind of make a like effectively as a breathing apparatus for himself and it was really fascinating it kind of reminds me of what you were talking about with the coral suit where it's just like where organic and practical kind of meets in the middle and you know that's one thing i like about black label as an entity is it's like you're working with the general idea of these characters but it leaves a lot of room for you to kind of make it your own while also working within that prestige plus size where you get a little bit of extra room. I have no idea if that, does that even make a difference to you? Cause you're doing it digitally, right? I mean, Oh God, yeah. Huge. I mean, it's funny. Cause I, I mean, I really should have asked for more money. <laughs> the pages do take a lot longer. And obviously then you've got the pressure of wanting it to be good. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, not that like whenever you do any page, you like you're, you're rushing it or phoning it in, but I would say I'm spending a good 50% more per page than I normally wow. would. Because, you know, you want it to be good, you know. And, like, RAM script is really just tight. You don't want to let the side down. But, it, I mean, what's quite interesting, got a lot of real estate, which means even, I mean, like, RAM's not filling the pages full of, like, seven panels or anything like that. He's sticking to, like, a normal, you know, five or six panel page. And it just means there's so much more space in those those panels and that's it's lovely so it is more work but there's feel this is sound it's going to sound really pretentious and i don't mean it to but you kind of you can just enjoy the art doing the art a little bit more because it's it's because it's different and because it's you're kind of breathing a little bit because you're spaced out it it's it just feels a bit more pleasurable at least for me um and uh, you know you can use the whole page as a as kind of a piece of art rather than thinking individual panels and obviously always in service to the story 
but it's been nice to think okay well the black label is primarily about creating a book you know and, and an object so it's been it's been cool and a challenge to think okay i want to make this beautiful and I actually have that in my mind this has got to be something that somebody can kind of flick through and think that's that that's nice that's an enjoyable thing to to own and to hopefully cherish so i'm doing a lot i mean a lot i i like a lot of kind of white gutters when i'm working but they're they're, they're gone and i'm trying to do a thing with um one of my favorite books is week three. Oh yeah obviously by um morrison and, and quiet lane and, and that book obviously dealt with time and space you know when i was thinking about well what's if I want to approach this book and think about what themes are in round story, how am I going to portray those with a sense of design? How's my design of my page layout going to help the story, but also maybe kind of contribute to the themes of that story or not contribute, but reflect is a better word, the, the themes of that story. It struck me, obviously, that the book was about pressure, but it was also about layers and depth obviously you've got the sea and you've got the kind of like the deeper you go the more things we're, we're going to discover and the same thing applies for the characters like any great drama as we go on the surface level is revealed and then we're going to get deeper and deeper and things are going to be revealed and these characters are going to kind of grow and change and be challenged by by the things in all their levels so i wanted to do i wanted to do something with the layouts that at least winked to that so each page is pretty much there is an image and then the panels this is not great for an audible uh, for, for, for me just talking because i'm doing my i'm moving my hands a lot <laughs> yeah. so, the, so each panel is like on top of each other so it's almost like stacked and so my thought was if that was a 3d space and you were to rotate the page in a 3d space these panels would be layered and we would see like that there's always they're always overlapping and it's always a bigger image underneath. So each page is full spread. There's and there's art all the way to the corners, which I don't normally do unless it's a, a splash page. So that's been fun. I said you gotta talk to your editors, gotta get that page rate bumped up. I know, I know. Okay, I'm not gonna draw a single page <laughs> unless I get more money. Heard it here first. <laughs> and now a quick word from one of off panel sponsors. Macroverse is a next-generation digital comics platform, and one with an astonishing number of comics, with currently over 50 series from over 100 creators on their app, with a 5-star rating both on Apple and Google's app stores. Download the app and binge all their titles, including the Eisner-nominated Remind from Jason Brubaker, Lisa K. Weber's Hex 11, which has been described as Harry Potter meets Blade Runner, or the new queer supernatural adventure series Husk that launches on November 1st. It's just $4.99 a month to subscribe to Macroverse, with proceeds directly supporting the creators on the platform. Keep an eye on the future of Macroverse 2, as 2022 is going to bring an epic upgrade that offers a new level of digital collectability and more, with early adopters able to sign up for more information at Macroverse.com. And now, back to the show. You know, related to like what I said earlier, where I called uh, Esad's art claustrophobic in, in Submariner of the Depths, I imagine going from like those regular comic size pages to this is kind of like the opposite where it's like the, the regular size pages yeah. feel claustrophobic and this one, it's like you get to expand, but I, I, we got, we got to move on. I want to touch on a couple of things before we get into bloodstained teeth, your upcoming creator owned series. I want to comment or talk about a line you said earlier about your in idiosyncratic style, because I came across an interview you did where you talked about how, and you may have said this facetiously. I'm pretty sure you laughed when you said it, but you said that you were your own greatest influence, which I think is both an, an amazing flex and an absolutely legit thing to say, because, you know, it's like you might like other artists, but only you put it together in a single look. It's like, you know, if you're a chef, everyone gets all the same ingredients. The influences are in the ingredients and you turn it into something deli uh, delicious from there. And that delicious thing is your delicious thing. You know, is your you described as an idio idiosyncratic style. Is it just kind of how you've always just seen art for yourself? Is that just how you ended up there? Or is that something you kind of developed into as you started to draw and paint and do everything else? I mean, I think it, it's it's a combination of the two things. It's It's... One is just having the confidence to do your work, right? And it's just, you just express yourself in the way that you express yourself. You know, we all have 
our way of expressing ourselves in whatever way that is, whether it be even through just conversation. You know, we all have our own style. And it was it's just basically it's just having the confidence to be like, this is my style and I'm going to push my style. And that doesn't mean that you don't look at what I think. Oh, I really love what they do there, and I really love what they do, and I really, you know, what they, you know, and I brought up kind of like Frank Quietly's work earlier. So it's not that you think, well, I'm the finished article. I don't need to look elsewhere. But I'm definitely. You have to. For me, it's about trusting that. It's also about trusting that that and this is going to sound really pompous, and I don't mean it to. And I'm gonna. I'm trying to think of a way of saying it that doesn't make me sound like I'm really big-headed, but I'm. I'm just gonna say it anyway. Sorry. You just have to trust your fans. I think. Do you know what I mean? Like you just have to think. Well, if people like what I do, then I must be all right. Yeah. If it, if it works, you don't need to doubt yourself. Exactly. I remember when when I did Black Bolt with Saladin. Like I was. I was really anxious about that, and I was because it was my first big Marvel book, and. I find it quite difficult to look back at some of it now. And uh, I really thought I was dropping the ball. I was like, oh, this is not, you know. Oh. And then we won the Eisner for it. And it was just like a flick in my head. And it and it was literally like, what you think of your own work, or rather your criticism of your own work, means nothing. And since then, I've just like, it does, I mean, it's not that I don't have bad days. And it's not that I don't do pages. I'm like, that could have been better. Or covers, that, that could have been better. And I don't like that. And there's other things that I, I like much more. And like any artist, there are things that I really love. And then gradually I find the faults. But it's just about trusting that my art got me here. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say to, to anyone that loves my work, well, you're wrong because it's not that good. Because that's kind of bullshit. You know, I love my work. It's got me where I am. And I, I love doing this amazing job. And I feel so lucky and privileged to have peers and to be on your show with you now that's an amazing thing and like there's not a day i go by that goes by that i'm like i'm doing what i've always wanted to do since i was a little kid like lots of us and i'm doing it i don't know how long i'm going to do it for i don't know how long people will love my work but i love my work because it's got me here and i think you've got to have that excitement and passion to really kind of, you know, you work long hours, you work till the middle of the night and you have the stress of deadlines. I mean, I used to be a school teacher. I taught um, 11 to 16 year olds in the East End of London. And I find this job more stressful. So <laughs> because you care and yeah. you want to, you want to, you, you don't want to let your editors down. You don't want to let your readers down. And it's, but it, it's, I always think back, and this is, I'm going off on a tangent, but I think it connects. I think back to when I first started I like really just first started. I'd just done Olympus at Image, which is a terrible book, but it was my start. And I remember an, uh, uh, an artist friend of mine who I didn't know hugely well, but he, he kind of said to me, and I, I won't say his name because because of what he said to me, he says, you'll do your best work when you don't care. Yeah. And, and I had a real like, I mean, he wasn't that much older than me, but I had a real like, what are you talking about, old man? But he was absolutely right. It's a weird thing, though, because it's not quite right in the regards that because you do care. But it's more that when you're a teacher, when you're a school teacher and you've got naughty kids and they're they're kind of like, you know, on the brink of right all the time and they're not listening to what you're saying and, and all this, and which happens. And then you get more experience as a teacher. Those things still happen. You're just better at dealing with it. Yeah. And I think being a comic book artist is the same thing. You just ignore the doubts. You just like, I've got a job to do. People love what I'm doing. I'm going to trust that. And I love that this has got me in this life that I'm living. And, you know, and that's the, that's kind of, that's my ethos, really. And I've, so far, that seems to have carried me quite far. Yeah. I mean, it seems like, you have to trust your own decision making, but you have to trust that eventually you're going to self doubt yourself in a way that is not yeah. actually useful. Because it's like it's I guess it comes down to knowing what to trust, and it seems like you just have to have faith in your own process. Even if you look at the page after you're done, and you're like, "Ah, eh, this could have been better." And you're like, "Yeah, it could have been better," but it also might not have been. So yeah, yeah. One thing I think is interesting about your work. We already talked about your colors. Have you ever been colored by anybody else? No, 
and I never would. I was going to say, is it impossible for you to think of line art without the color? Before I was a teacher, um, what I did at university, I, I studied illustration, but I specialized, I specialized in two things. One was children picture books. Mm-hmm. And the other thing was I used to do uh, big abstract canvases, figurative, but they were very, you know, very kind of um, loose and, and expressionist you know and very expressive marks and and interesting colors and you know and i think it's the combination of those two things the storytelling from the children's picture books which has to be really on point and Mm -hmm. like really clear and pure storytelling with the kind of the abstraction and the expression of, of of this style of painting and i think it was the combination of those two things so i don't really think when i'm doing a page i don't really think now i'm doing the pencils doing the inks now i'm doing the colors i will it will all be at the same time and like sometimes i'll paint the background and then paint the characters in sometimes i'll i'll do line work and then paint that in but it changes and it evolves like a painting on the canvas layers on layers on layers on layers and it's and it's also that way i can be a bit more instinctive and allow textual things to happen allow accidents to happen because where there are accidents there are tension and where there is tension that creates interest and excitement and that's how visually you kind of you engage people yeah um so it, it's it's really just the way that i work that has led me to be less of a stages and more of a kind of like everything all at the same time so honestly i i don't i don't know how anyone could color me i don't think i don't think i it could work um i certainly i'd have to work in a very different way and i don't think it would be my work right i do think it's funny um i would love to see other artists watch you work because i imagine they'd be like what is he doing this is crazy this is so different than me because it reminds me of like um i think it was tamra bonville and the colorist and she was talking about how she had different layers i think for each color or something or each each something and there, there would be like a situation where she'd end up with like 70 layers or some something like that and others all work kind of within the same layer and they were just I remember colorists, maybe it wasn't Tamara, but they were reacting to another colorist who worked in this way. And they're like, completely, their minds were blown. And I mean, I mean, it kind of comes down to like what you were saying before. It's like, you know, you work the way you work because it's worked for you before and you have to trust it will continue to work for you going forward. And it all is one piece to you. That's it totally makes sense to me. But, you know, we're going to jump into Bloodstained Teeth here in a second. But I am curious, did you always want to write or did you largely view yourself as an artist and this just kind of came up? No, always, always. I mean, like, you know, I'm sure every comic book artist when they were kids and um, used to write their own little comics. I mean, I'd be surprised if I'm the only one. But yeah, I used to write comics when I was a kid. I used to do it when I was a teenager. I did it when I was like an older teenager. And so it was always the goal to have characters and to sort of tell my own stories. And then kind of I fell into comics by accident. Mm -hmm. I never thought I could do it um, as much as I love comics because my my work was so strange, for want of a better word. So I never really thought I could do comics as much as it was my literal dream job. And it just sort of happened slowly at first then all of a sudden it rushed and and was a thing and i was like oh my god i'm a comic book artist and and the reason why i didn't write for ages was just because of um the opportunities that i got like so you know there was always a book that i was going to do and then matt fraction was like do you want to do a book together and i was like well as a writer i don't compare to matt so yes i want to do a book with, with with you matt and then and then again it was like opportunities would arise and you're always thinking where does that opportunity take me what what doors does that opportunity open up and it never felt like the right time to start writing and um and I always wanted to just write for myself and be a you know a a a solo creator that I would write and 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 draw my own stories I had a kind of epiphany a couple of years ago that I realized that if that it was never going to happen because I was always going to choose other writers to work with because I'd be too, you know, I've got two small children. I've got a mortgage to pay. Um, you know, you do for all of my talk of, of 
you know, trusting myself and just being like, yeah, I'm, I'm my favorite artist and all that. You still think I've still got to make sure that I'm, I'm maintaining my career and I'm kind of getting the sort of gigs that I now need to pay my mortgage and to kind of keep us, you know, in, 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 you know, get keep the bills paid and the food bought and, and, and kids clothed and all those things like any job does. So I realized that I'm not going to have the confidence to leap into essentially another part of the unknown of, of my career. And that's when I realized that, OK, I'm going to write for somebody else. I'm, I'm going to just be a writer and I'm going to separate the two. I'll be an artist over here for my day job and my weekend and evening job and my, you know, hobby that hopefully will pay will be me writing. And that's when I did I did Machine Gun Wizards with uh, with Sammy and Dark Horse. Mm-hmm. Machine Gun Wizards was at the time was kind of my baby. Like I had a whole thing planned for it. It was going to be like 24 issues, like a massive epic. And I was, it was going to be me drawing the whole thing. And it just, the absurdity of that just suddenly struck me. I go, I'm never going to do that. Yeah. Because it's, I've got to live in a real world. I can't be like a first time writer and just be like, here's my book that runs for six years. And even just logistically, how am I going to write and draw a monthly book for four years? keep the sales up and, and have the time to do it. So I was just like, you, it was a realization that I've got to be more realistic. So we, I reworked it into something a bit more manageable, pitched it to Dark Horse, got the green light, and then worked with Sammy and just fell in love. With yeah. It. it was, it's, I mean, being a comic book artist is great. It's amazing. But I think writers, comic book writers have, and it's nothing to do with the fact that drawing a comic takes longer than um, writing the comic. You know, there's no dispute. There's more man hours in, in, in drawing a comic. But there's something, so, but it's nothing to do with that, what I'm about to say. There's a magic about writing something, sending it to your artist, and then getting art back and seeing the story come to life. And I didn't think I would get that as an artist because I can imagine what it's going to look like. Right. And I could have sat down and drew, and drew it myself. But it was just seeing Sammy send pages back. I was like, oh, my God, that was in my head two days ago. It was just incredible. And so from that, it was I realized, actually, I don't have to be a solo you know, creator. I can be a bit more kind of free and easy and kind of fluid and, and write for artists who I really love, who might tell a story, one of my stories, better and be better suited for it than I am because mm-hmm. my art's very specific for what it fits and I could kind of shape it for certain stories I could shape certain stories to fit better but why not go to artists who who have a completely different style something I could never do who are who are going to be able to knock that out of the park far better than I can it reminds me of um god I don't remember who said this but it was another artist who started writing comics and they told me basically that they had too many story ideas to draw them all yeah and you know that's just a conundrum that you kind of have to deal with because it's if if you, you tried to make all of your story ideas ones that you would draw yourself especially because you know your, your art styles sounds as if it's fairly time consuming it certainly looks like as if it's pretty time consuming you would have to be like immortal like one of the characters from bloodstained teeth well i guess one of the firstborn yeah. but still anyways well let's jump into that yeah that was the this is the big thing we're here to talk about it's uh bloodstained Teeth, your image series that launches on April 27th with you writing and drawing the main covers and doing some design work as well uh, with Patrick Reynolds on the line art, Heather Moore on colors and Hassan Otsman L. Howe lettering. Here's a solicit. Um, Atticus Sloan, misanthrope, criminal, asshole and vampire lives in a world where blood isn't the only thing vamps crave. And for the right price, he'll make you a vampire, too. After all immortality isn't cheap i want to start with the origins of this because and I, I have no doubt you're going to recount this story a million times you probably already have but did it start with your deep love and fascination with vampires i'm being semi-facetious i have no idea if you love vampires well it's so weird i mean yes yeah, yes and no it was it was one of those times when um i mean Catherine, my wife always takes the piss out because when i've you know like any partner of anyone who's kind of creative, I'm sure everyone gets it. I will go down and go, I've got a great idea for a story. And she'll have to sit there do- dutifully and nod her head and go, yeah, that sounds great. And, and, you know, every time. And and she always takes 
takes the piss out of me because I, I go down and go, well, it's called this. Like I always, I always lead with the title. And normally the title comes as the story develops. I'm like, that's what I'm going to call it. And this, the title was the first thing that came. I didn't even really know it was about vampires. Mm. It was the weirdest thing. It was just like the title popped into my head. I was like, that's a cool title. And then literally went, and it built itself. Yeah. And once it was just like that, the kind of the core thing. And, I'm, and I must say, before we get any further, the kind of, you, you've obviously, you've read the issue now, the kind of core conceit, we're kind of, we're keeping that a little bit hidden, which people will find out when, when they kind of read the issue that, that there's, it's not as straightforward as they think it is. Um, so that came to me. I, I Really quick, really quick. I just want to say that, like, I think the promotional materials compared it to 100 Bullets, which at first I didn't really get. And then I read it and I was like, I get it. And I, that's all I'll say. I, I feel like that if you've read 100 Bullets, you might kind of yeah. grasp the nature of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's hookier than than, uh, than you might think. And so and once that the hook was just like, oh, my God. And then it just built itself and, and, and what's quite interesting like i i really wanted to i wanted it to i mean it's about vampires and of course it's about vampires and it is a love letter to you know everything you know in vampire law and and but it's it's also i wanted to do something like any horror tries to do and actually talk about something and so i've let that guide the story and obviously we're talking about class and we're talking specifically about kind of like billionaires right and the billionaires in this world essentially are vampires because let's be honest that's really what a billionaire is and it's it's i wanted to sort of look at sort of social care and i wanted to look at um health care that becomes a big thing in the book and the idea of, of really we don't really have an altruistic kind of society we have a society that's built on capitalism not a society that's built on looking after each other Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, this pandemic has, has highlighted that more than ever. And so it was very much once the idea that the, the, this society is a vampire and it preys on the poor and the vulnerable and it feeds on their their ability to survive as much as it does their blood, then everything kind of fell into place with how we were going to tell this story, with the hook that, that makes it this kind of crime thriller leading us through it so it's been great i mean and like i've shared it with a lot of my peers and and you know some people that i've known and some people that have been very gracious who don't know me who have like read the book and you know then given us a full quote and it's been so exciting to see the common thread through what everyone's kind of fed back and said is is that it's unlike any other vampire thing that yeah. they've ever read and it's like a real refresh and unlike anything else and like and that is I mean, I can't think of any higher praise. I mean, because how many vampires? So many. Stories. Thousands, right? Yeah. I mean, that was one of the things that I think really stood out about it is like, you know, when you tell somebody you have a vampire story coming up, I think in their minds, they have an idea of what it's going to be. It's tough to differentiate. I mean, honestly, like for a long time, people just would just they would say like, oh, Twilight. And I'm just like, that always kind of graded at me because there's so many flavors of vampire stories. But um, weirdly. Have you ever read Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips' Sleeper? Uh, yeah, 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 cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In a weird way, it kind of reminds me of that, mostly because it's like there's like the Illuminati, like the people who run the world element of Sleeper, and then there's kind of like the working stiff, not the working stiff, because it's like part of their class, but someone who's also totally not their people, yeah. who has to kind of deal with a situation that he created, at least in part, because he doesn't give a shit about that world. And also he's kind of like actively working against them. That In that regard, it kind of reminded me of like 100, 100 Bullets meets that. And one thing I do really like about the concept is the way that you have it set up just in my mind. And you're going to have to tell me if I get too far into any spoiler territory. But just in my mind, one thing that's cool about this is you could go as long as you want or as short as you want with this. It's very like flexible because of the way you have it set up. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and that's you know, that's intentional. I mean, we've we, we've set we're set up as an ongoing, and we know, like I've just finished writing issue six. Patrick's he'll be starting on issue six in about three weeks. Wow! And obviously, you know, we've only just solicited. We've today just solicited issue two, so we're well ahead. And then uh, I, we'll just be waiting to see what happens with the sales. You know, if the sales are there, 
we can kind of really go forward. And I also, it's funny you bring up, you know, Ed and Shaw. I've been playing with the idea that even though we've got this kind of central character, Atticus, who's got this really interesting story and he's, he's definitely a character, the more I write the world, the more it opens up. And I could, I could also see that we would have, you know, spin-off characters and, and, you know, maybe we'd focus on a character that we only saw for a, a few panels on, on one issue and then go off on a different tangent. And it could be that either, you know, from a kind of logistic point of view, it could be that we have guest artists a bit like to put what Department of Truth do uh, and to, so we don't put too much pressure on Patrick. I mean, because I, I have to say, I've been so lucky with him on this book. I mean, he is the, as much as I'm, I'm really confident in the story and, and the themes behind and certainly the hook, um, it wouldn't be for now if it wasn't for Patrick and the combination of his just utterly sublime realism with Heather's psychedelic colours, which are just, you know, for anyone that hasn't seen it, just, just search it out. That, that It's just such a magic combination. Uh, um, so huge kudos to them and thanks to them for their hard work and and their passion in the book. I mean, the, you know, obviously Patrick's a, a co-creator and, and Heather's cutted the, the overall ownership deal because, you know, it's creative right? and I wanted her to feel like she was, a you know, she wasn't just kind of what worked for hire. She owned some of it. Working with them and Heather, the, the editor, and has the letter, you know, everyone just has been so supportive and seems to just genuinely love the story in the book. And and I feel very, very privileged to be working with such talented people at the height of their their powers, doing like what I think is their best work. Um, so just want to just want to say how good I think they all are. And now a quick word from one of our panel sponsors. That sponsor is Bad Idea, and I keep asking Bad Idea what I should say here, and they keep saying wing it, so... Hey! Bad Idea! Find their comics, I guess. And now, back to the show. I actually wrote about this today in my column that goes up each Friday with just like 10 things I liked or didn't like from Comics in a Week, and, I, and I, I mentioned this to you before, it just feels so well thought out visually. It's A lot of times it's like, comics look good, but they... There's like a, I don't want to say that there isn't cohesion because the story is the story, but there's just something about this where everything just fits so well together. Like yeah, Heather's colors really, you know, bringing back the Brubaker and Phillips at all, it reminds me a lot of an electric neon version of like Jacob Phillips's colors to a certain degree. Yeah. And and then Haas, like I love how Haas mixes uppercase and mixed case in there. And yeah. and then yeah. like then your design with you and Haas doing the design where you have like the names of the characters and their roles. There's just something about it where everything well, oh, just that that is all Haas. Is that all Haas? He, okay. He came up with that. That's all him, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. that that stuff, all of that together, you just read it and it just feels so like it's weird. It's like one of those situations where you you read something and it's like you didn't know this was the answer, but once you get to it, it's the only answer. If that makes sense. Yeah. Oh my god, David, I'm so excited. Like I'm I'm I mean yeah, I'm really excited about Aquaman and it's fantastic. And as you know, as we opened up, I'm buzzing about that. But this is just it's just thrilling on just a whole different level. And I just hope that I mean everyone hopes that people go out and and buy buy your book when it's your book, but even if it's just take myself out, out of the equation, I just hope because Patrick is so modest. I mean, if you ever have him on, he's so he's such a lovely, lovely man, but he doesn't realize how amazing he is. What did, I, I, what did I tell you when we first emailed or messaged? I was like, I think he's one of the most underrated artists in comics. Yeah. He's incredible. Yeah, he always has been. He is, isn't he? Yeah. And he doesn't know it. Um, and like, I have to keep reminding him that he's the co-creator, mm-hmm. that he's like, this is his book as as well, uh, you know, as well as mine, um, because he, I don't think, you know, and, and it's like, I mean, we don't, we don't know what our numbers are yet, but the, some of the things that we're hearing sort of suggest that it's going to be at least, you know, pretty decent. And he's, I mean, he's not literally doing this, but he's like, la, 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 <laughs> with his fingers in his ears, because he, he, it's almost like he can't, I can't hear that, but it's, 
I almost hope, I mean, obviously I want it to be a huge hit for, selfishly. Of course I do. A big part of that is I would love it just to blow the doors off for him and for Heather. And just because they, they are such superstars that I'd love as wide of an audience for them as possible. Because really, I mean, like like any you know rock, comic writer, I think you know, you need to sit in the back a little bit, you know, and they're the orchestra and you're behind them and just let let the audience enjoy them. Yeah. I want to give two really quick compliments to Patrick for the, for the issue. First off, I do want to say that I think it's this is like one of the only titles I can think of. I think the only other one is Time Before Time with Declan Shalvey, where the mm. writer is the primary cover artist on the book. But um, <laughs> yeah. you, you have I mean, the variants are going to help you achieve your numbers because you got Jamie McKelvey and Declan Shalvey on there also. But Patrick's variant, I wouldn't say this lightly, given the the nature of, of this run of covers. It reminds me of like like not specifically, but qualitatively and all uh, vibe wise glenn fabry on preacher which oh yeah like that variant is just it's so perfect it's so well done and then the yeah. other thing he does really well in the issue is like he does really and you know i'm sure you all talked about this but the world building in it the visual world building like in mm-hmm. the the second page i don't even know if this counts as a spoiler there's like a billboard that says are you behaving father is yeah. watching those things that he builds into the world feel so organic while still standing out in like a really effective way those are like those are two things that are tough to do. I just compared him to Glenn Fabry and basically said that he's able to world build without being showy about it. And those are two tough things to do. I know. Did you hear that, Patrick? <laughs> Not just me being nice. <laughs> he blows my socks off. And it's funny because like when we did the first issue, he would he'd send these his layouts in and uh, me and Heather would give him any notes that we needed to give him, which weren't many. And as we've gone on, I just I don't even I don't give him notes. I just let him do what he does. You know, I don't, I don't kind of prescribe or do it this way or do it that way. I don't even, I don't need to, you know, and he, you know, he took him a while to be like, boys, are any notes? Do you need to change anything? And I was no, you know what you're doing. If I wanted it to look a certain way, I would have drawn it myself. I surprised me, thrill me, you know, tell my story back. I mean, that's what an artist does, right? Right. A great artist tells the story back to the writer. And it's, it's like this weird synergy where, where the art you tell the story to the artist, and he's the only, he or she is the only person that reads your story. It's like a very personal audience, one on one, and then the same thing happens. You know, they tell the story back to you, and then and then then it goes wide. So he's just, you know, and I think he's getting more confident. I mean, the last issue of this arc, it's it's amazing. Yeah, some of the pages, I was like, oh my. God, I mean, he works so hard. I mean, I literally had to have a conversation with him the last few weeks, where I was like, "You don't have to work as hard as work as hard as you're working. <laughs> you could work like seventy five percent of your effort, and it would still be amazing. And you could get more sleep and more time off, and because he's like every day, boom, 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 boom. So you know." I'm trying to look after his well welfare as much as anything else, but he's um, he's mind blowing, and I really hope. I mean, I'm I'm really hoping that it does well, and you know, who knows? Maybe him and Heather get some eyes and nods because I think they they deserve it. If I can be as biased as I'm being, um, but yeah, very exciting. I feel like uh, the fact that he's already working on issue six, and you just finished the script for issue six, definitely underlines how hard he's working because. That kind of uh, distance between artist and writer is pretty rare. But, you know, one thing I want to bring up is one of the things I thought of when I was reading it. God, this is this used to not be an archaic reference, but it kind of reminded me of like Occupy Wall Street with like, you know, the billionaires versus, yeah. you know, the, the 99 percent and everything. It is interesting because there's that element. But then it also ties into one of my like longstanding things that I've always found odd about vampires, which is they simultaneously seemingly do not have occupations, but they also live lavishly. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, I've always been like, what do they do? That's the hook, right? That's the whole thing. And, you know, I can talk about this because that's 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 kind of public. But wait, really quick, really quick. I just want to say, I feel like the immortality isn't cheap, which is both in the solicit and on the first page of the book is such an important phrase for this entire title. Yeah, because it's it's a double whammy, right? It's, you know, Atticus, for anyone that doesn't know that the, the, the public hook of the book that people know is Atticus Sloan is a vampire for hire. And he's worked out to make a living. He will charge 
humans a fee to bite them and turn them into a vampire. Sips. So sips. Yeah. Taking a sip. That's that's where that comes from. Taking a sip. Yeah. Um, so he just takes a sip and they turn into what it's a derogative term in the vampire world. A sip. If you're a sip, you're kind of yeah. So there's there's a whole like hierarchy thing going on. So to take a sip, uh, that's how he makes his money, uh, which is frowned upon by the high the firstborns, the people that were born a vampire. Elitist jerks. Yeah. With their terrible parties. <laughs> yeah. And um but obviously, yeah, it, it's but it's also it, it's also about how does he survive? And obviously the the um the kind of the firstborns, the the whole thing about billionaires is they're basically just siphoning the money off us. That's how they do it. But like people like Atticus who aren't members of the top family they're just kind of like really they're kind, even though he's a vampire he's closer to us than he is to them how does he survive and one of the big influences when i was kind of like tying this story together was uncut gems and good times by the sadie brothers the, yeah yeah and um both those films it's just really about what desperation and, and just wanting to survive will push you to do mm-hmm. uh, for, uh, and so really it's very much about that like what does he have to do to survive and to make money because if you're if you live forever where does that money come from as you pointed out and that's the that's the kind of crux of the whole thing i feel like i can talk about this because it's in the preview pages but i just want to say i definitely related to the character who was turned into a vampire and then immediately posted about it on instagram (laughs) just just because it's like i think if i was turned into a vampire i would definitely post about it because it's like that's a pretty significant life event like i post about like my cats a lot if i turn into a vampire there's a certainty that i i don't know if i'd use hashtag thing life but i would definitely post about it well yeah of course you would And, and and that's the thing i mean that's been the fun of this is we we almost have more fun with it by injecting reality into it. So what would people do? And that's the thing. Like, if you could be a vampire, what would you do? And that's where we kind of we're going to use those springboards to kind of go off and kind of explore some things. Um, yeah, Fang Life hashtag. One thing I would say about Atticus Sloan that I like about him that, that relates to this is there's uh, it's very rare that you come across a vampire character that is pragmatic and he's very like his, his life is about like, I want to continue to have like nice suits and maintain this apartment and have all the stuff I want. And so he like, he looks at, he's just basically like a guy that's a vampire and also part of hustle culture, which is a very unique blend. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah. He likes his vinyl. He likes his nice suits and none of that comes cheap. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah, it's funny because when I was reading it, I was just thinking of all the different directions you could take because, you know, you brought up like Department of Truth, but like, you know, something like Crossover, Donnie Cates and uh, Jeff Shaw's book, where they all have like these issues where it's like Chips Darsky and like Phil Hester and, you know, what whoever else like pop in and they do a story that's just set in the world. And like mm-hmm. there's so many different directions you could go in just with like the mechanics of how the vampire stuff works. Yeah. Like I, there's a lot of questions I would love to ask you, but I pretty, pretty much think that anything involving this subject or like who the head of PR is in for the for the firstborn, that's definitely too far into spoiler territory. That's definitely a spoiler. A few of my people have read it said they literally went you know yeah i won't say anymore yeah yeah last question with bloodstained teeth i do have to ask like you did machine gun wizards at dark horse and it's at least as far as i understand the mechanics of how a series works over there would be considerably different at image where it's kind of all on you does it feel way different doing a pure creator owned series like this where it's just all on you right yeah it is i mean like i would say it's weird because when i did i mean i've always done cry my books at image so, you know, that's where I started off. And I've done more books at Image than anywhere else. So even though I've not done a book at Image for, for quite a while, yeah, it's something I'm quite used to. So when I did that book at, at Dark Horse, uh, Machine Gun Wizards, I did it anyway. 
I did oh, you the did pro- the stuff? Like, I, like you did all yeah, the management, I basically? I mean, like, they did it as well. I mean, they set interviews up and they kind of, like, you know, they, it's not like they didn't do anything. They absolutely did. But I just did what I did anyway. So I would reach out to people and say, hey, do you want to do an interview? I would kind of, like, send the book off for, like, some pull quotes and see who would enjoy it. And then I'd put some graphics together, some promo ads together. So it, 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 you don't have to do that if you work, if you do a book of Dark Horse. But I chose to because it's my book and I want it to do well. Um, but yeah, I, I um, I'm very hands on, and I'm very, I'm a hustler. You and Atticus Sloan. Yeah, I mean, we've got that in common, and you know, and it, it is about survival. It's about pushing yourself and just wanting to, you know, be proud of what you do, and, and just wanting to shout about it. And and I think that can, I think as long as that comes from a place of genuine. You know, it's not about kind of like wanting to make a load of money or anything like that and not caring about what you're doing. It's about doing something going, I love this and I want other people to love it. And I want I want to take someone on a ride. And I think as long as you're shouting and you're banging the drum and you you, you want people to hear about it, I think it, people respond well to that because you, they can sense that it, it's from a place of genuine excitement, which it is. So I'm quite happy just to kind of keep, you know, We've got so many pull quotes on this that I've sent it to people and they've been so gracious and just given us the most wonderful things. And, you know, I've been spreading that across social medias and and talking about it. And, you know, like you're coming on shows with yourself. And, um, yeah, it's just what I do. I'm quite used to that. I'm quite used to that being a big part of, of, of launching your own book and writing interviews and, and talking about it. I quite like it. Yeah. So I quite like it. Like, you know, because it's exciting. It's it's great to sort of like talk about what we love. We all love comics, so why not have a chat about it? I mean, it, and doing stuff like this is great. And I'm, so I haven't done a convention like many people for. Well, we could, we, we had a, a young daughter uh, two years ago, so I haven't done a convention for really the best part of three years. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm quite excited to maybe do some conventions later in the year, all being well, and that will be great too, just to sort of connect with people and hopefully this. I mean, I must say one thing that we're really looking forward to, and we, I'm keeping my fingers crossed it's going to happen. I mean, Atticus Sloan cosplay, that's going to happen. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Surely. it's easy. Yeah, you just got to look a little bit like David Bowie. You got to have a swanky suit. Yeah. You got to have, you know, perfect gold tooth. You both look like a vampire and just like a stylish person, which is pretty much yeah. the best blend of things. But yeah. I do think it's kind of interesting. I imagine like you enjoy the announcement day vibes for like Aquaman or something like that. But I also imagine having, I'm, I'm not trying to say that I, I particularly get this book on a different level, but having a conversation with somebody who when you're doing like an interview where that person is enthusiastic and is appreciating details about the book i imagine that's invigorating because like when you're in the creation process you're like this works for me i hope this works for others and then when you start finding out people are reacting to it the way that you hope then i imagine that's that's a great feeling as well oh it's amazing yeah there's nothing like it there's nothing like it you know, I mean, even just the other day, I got a random because obviously I, because this book's coming out, and I wanted to remind people that it wasn't like my debut book as a writer. So I've kind of been reminding people about Machine Gun Wizards, which I, you know, I'm equally as proud of. And I had like just some random guy um, tweet at me, just they picked it up because they, it appealed to them, and they just were saying how much they loved it. It's amazing just to give somebody that pleasure. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And just to think, you know, I love story whether it be in a novel a comic tv show or film i love being taken places and just being surprised and and you know thrilled and not know what's going to happen and just being able to do that to somebody there's nothing there's nothing better yeah nothing that's awesome yeah okay to close i want to talk about some broader things i i mentioned earlier you had a story dropped this week on three worlds three moons trans it's transit and it's from you the three worlds three moons team of jonathan hickman mike del mundo mike huddleston uh also russ wooten lettering and jonathan hickman designing everything it's great actually i read it last night and it's you did such a it's, it's amazing it's only 12 pages, but it's it's fascinating reading that because there's just like so many great big ideas and execution in those 12 pages. Like it's more than that. And like yeah. some trade paperbacks I've read, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to watch what you're up to as like a creator, because, you know, you got that where it's just like you can kind of dabble with something like that. You have like a long term project. We didn't even talk about the fact you're working with Oscar Isaac on uh, on Head Wounds. Uh, you have that. You have Bloodstained Teeth. You have Aquaman uh, Andromeda. You got a lot going on. Uh, yeah, I'm tired. When. <laughs> I'm sure you are. When you're like kind yeah. of 
looking at your path. And, you know, you mentioned earlier you had that other book that came up around right before Aquaman and everything like that. Are you just like responding to projects that appeal to you as they come up? Or do you have to be more deliberate than that at this point? Like you're trying to cultivate a path for yourself to make it sound really craven. I mean, I turn stuff down. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't say yes to everything. Not if Oscar Isaac calls. Oh, oh it was so funny. I did turn him down. Oh, my God. <laughs> No, it was so funny. Yeah, so he, um, not him. I mean, he doesn't call you. His people got in touch. And legendary who the publishers, they got in touch. And I said, oh, hi, uh, you know, we, we, we want you to do this book. And it's with, um, with Oscar Isaac. And like, me and my wife, we are huge Oscar Isaac fans. Yeah. Like, basically, um, Inside Louis. Uh, Louis oh, um, yeah. The Coen Brothers movie. One of my favorite films ever. I love that film. Do you ever watch Show Me a Hero? Yeah, yeah. He's incredible in that, too. Ah. So it comes from that far more than, say, Star Wars or, or you know, some of the latest stuff he's done. And so when I got this email, I walked into, like, Catherine was uh, in the bedroom. And I walked in and I was like, you are not going to believe the email that I've just got. And uh, and we we had a geek out. Go, oh my god, it's incredible! And I said, okay, I'm just going to go back and turn them down because I was <laughs> like, you know, I was so worried that it was just going to be a vanity project. Sure. You know, I didn't know, I didn't know Oscar, I didn't know him at all. Um, and I thought, why don't we want to? I don't want to be a, a vanity project. And I emailed back, and I was very nice. I was like, oh, you know, I'm a huge fan uh, uh, of Oscar, and I really like what you guys do at Legendary. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I am going to have to turn it down. And I, the, the reason I gave, which was completely true, is it's like I like to, I like to own, you know, anything that I do that's not like big two. I like to own it. I like it to be mine. And they came back and they they gave me a slice. I mean, oh. very small, like yeah, very small. It was more a gesture than than anything kind of like you know significant. But it gave you a stake. It gave you a part of it. Yeah, they get they were like. But it, 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 it sort of said to me, it was just very flowering. I was like, oh, wow, I didn't expect that. And they were like, they were like okay, can we just get you on the phone with Oscar? And just he can tell you about it. And like, Catherine was just like, oh, my God, I know exactly what's going to happen. He's going to charm you and you're going to be like, oh, OK, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> and it's and it, 100 percent. That's what happened. And he was like the pandemic had just started. So it was like March. So we'd all like sort of shut down. And he, he he pops up on the screen, and I remember he kind of like we were zooming, and it was a and it started ringing, and like obviously I'm a bald man with a beard, and like I'd already completely let myself go in like the the, the few weeks into the pandemic, and like uh, any bald man will tell you if you let your hair grow, you just look like you look awful. I was like, where's my beanie? Where's my hat? I can't <laughs> have him see me like this. It was like running around frantic. So anyway, and then he comes on, and it, honestly. I'm not just saying this. He's the nicest person you could ever possibly want to meet. I was just, I couldn't believe how nice he was. And not like a kind of, not a showman nice. There's like a, he, there's a genuine connection that he wants to make. And it, it and he told me about the story and where the story came from. Because it's connected to his, one of his childhood friends who had cancer. Mm -hmm. And he had this dream that, um, he woke up with a head wound no one else could see um, and that stayed with him and thankfully the, the cancer went to remission and he's absolutely fine now but he, at the time he, he did think he was terminal and then they developed this idea of this person with this head wound that no one can see into this story of kind of empathy and we were in this time you know the whole thing with kind of like you know Trump and everything was going on and people just nasty and horrible and I just thought, God, what to have a story about empathy right now just felt quite right. Yeah. And when they told me about it, it it's very much like kind of like um, Angel Heart, you know, with Mickey Mickey Rourke, very kind of like Southern Gothic crime thriller with like touches of supernatural. And my first thought was that they'd found Machine Gun Wizards just because they were trolling like the latest comics or whatever and thought that I was Sammy. <laughs> because I thought, well, Sammy would be good for this. That was honestly what I thought. And I said to him, are you sure you want me for this? And the only reason why I knew he wanted me, because he started talking about stuff that I'd done, not just comics, but also illustrations. Like I'd done a series of Steve McQueen illustrations, and he was talking about those. Mm -hmm. Heck has he seen those? He's thorough. I know. He's got good people. <laughs> yeah, they, they completely won me over. And I was like, okay. And I mean, it, I mean, it helped that 
it was, it was a stressful time as it was for a lot of people. Like Dark Horse, we just put pencils down on on um, Invisible Kingdom because mm-hmm. the printing presses had all shut down, as you probably remember. Yeah, and we had another we had another child on the way, so it was quite stressful. So it was literally just a godsend. This this project falling into my lap, and um, yeah, for about three months, it was pretty much weekly having Zoom chats with Oscar. And like the rest of the team kind of developing the story. So I felt very much involved in it. That's awesome. So it, was, it was a cool project. It was cool. I completely sabotaged my original question because I wanted to get an Oscar Isaac joke in. But going back to that, like when, when you said you turn projects down when it comes to kind of planning everything out, is it all about kind of what's presented to you and going for opportunities that make sense? Or is it more like you have a plan that you want to match up to, if that makes sense. I mean, it's a little bit of both, but I mean, it, it, I, I've got to, re- I've got to kind of connect with more. There's three things. I've, one, I've got to, if it's a big two thing, I've got to care about the character. I mean, one, I got offered a um, Spider-Man thing um, a while back now and a really cool Spider-Man thing with a really good writer. I won't say who, because I don't want, you know, anyone to think, anything and i turned that down because i was like i, I can't be asked spider-man that's like my li- i love spider-man the character but the idea of drawing him swinging through the, the buildings it just sent cold shudders going through me i was like oh my god i'd have to draw all those buildings and windows <laughs> no thank you uh so there's, there's things like that um so i have to like the character or at least be like in the case of black bolt or aquaman be intrigued by them sure or it be some sort of new take that's thrilling and exciting like with the ultimates with al ewing where he did like the life bringer thing oh yeah Yeah. it was amazing but it also has to be working with a writer that brings something to the table that i couldn't bring to the table as a writer do you know what i mean so Mm -hmm. it's it's well it needs to be you know working with someone you know i've been god i've been so lucky like you know matt and Saladin, and then you know Willow, who was amazing. I mean, me and Willow will be friends forever now. She was just incredible to work with, uh, and you know, and now working with Ram, who just has such integrity in his stories. So it's that really. It's wanting to you want to do. I, I don't want to do fluff. I don't want to do something that's just empty. Even if it's superhero, it has to have some merit behind it, and and and. I don't, I'm not embarrassed about doing superhero stories. I think they can be fun and, fro- uh, and, and entertaining. I, I don't do big slam bang action necessarily. So it has to be something, well, what am I bringing to this? And so if I if a project is presented to me and I'm bringing something to it, then it's, it's, it's definitely a contender. But I mean, I'm aiming towards, the main thing I'm aiming towards is basically either a solo... Um, create my own book or a solo big two book that i write and draw i mean like what daniel warren's doing is is kind of like very much like i'd love to do that i mean i'd love to take a character and do my own spin on um you know and i'm really hoping that me and the, the black label guys are all getting on really well i mean chris Con- conroy um and I, hopefully this book does well i would love to do i'd love to stay on at black label and maybe do a take on someone else but then, yeah, moving towards probably like a solo image book is, you know, that's the end goal. So it's something that I can just pour my heart into and just take people on the ride. How does something like the the transit story fit in? Was it just being interested in everything they had going on there? Because it's, it's such like a sliver compared to what you normally do. You know, it's 12 pa- or eight pages, I guess, really. It was eight pages, yeah. I mean... Here's the thing, that's just working with those guys because they're so talented. I mean, like, it was it was kind of easy because, like, um, you know, Mike uh, Huddleston had done all the... He, like, I didn't design a single thing in that comic. Yeah, like the, the whale the whale cities with the Vojo, Vojo Gaunt? Yeah. 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 And it, even, like, even to the thing, like, the... The, um, there's like one panel where there's um, uh, like kind of like a priest, I suppose, giving a kind of e- eulogy. He designed that. I mean, the detail was just incredible. I was embarrassed because like he sent me this all this beautiful work, and like some of the characters he drew quite large and detailed and everything. They were tiny in my panels, like you couldn't see them. I was like, he spent all this time producing <laughs> this beautiful world building, and I'm just doing like literal stick figures because they're so small in my panel. Um, but yeah, it was working with with those two. And I was intrigued by the whole Substack thing. I was just intrigued about it. It's a different thing. But mostly it was working with John because um, we launched our first books almost together. 
So I, I he launched Nightly News. Nightly News, yeah, it was just before Olympus. And in fact, if you pick up Olympus, there's a pull quote on it from John. We've kind of lost touch since. I mean, obviously, we work together just now. Um, but yeah, we, we we kind of because we came up together, we were kind of like used to chat on. This is how old it was. We used to chat on AIM. Oh, oh my God, I love it. Yeah, I know, right? And it was at a time. I remember John was also like, I'll, and I was like, let's do a book together. And he said, uh, and he was quite right, let's not do a book first. You do another book first because he, because he had a very, we had, we had a very different style, but a similar sensibility. Sure. Um, and he was worried, which I thought was very gracious, but I don't think he, he needed to. He was worried that if we did another book together, if we did a book together, like, and it was my second book, People would be confused. They would think that he did the art because obviously he did in the first one. There'd be a bit of a confusion. So he was like, I'll do another book um, and then we'll do the third book together. Uh, and then and then he did his first gig at Marvel and never looked back. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we kind of missed that chance. And it, and as what well, natural, you know, you kind of drift apart and uh, and that's what happened. And so when, you know, he got in touch and was like, do you want to do this thing? It was just a no brainer, really, because I was just like, I've always wanted, I, I love his work. He, his world building is just don't think there's anyone that matches him at the moment. It's just incredible. Um, and just such interesting, exciting stories that just go places you don't expect, and just there's a density to them that's just in in lesser hands would would, would be deadening, but in his hands are just thoroughly exciting. So it just just to sort of dip my toe, and it was just so manageable. I, well, I say it was manageable, but those eight pages of like really caused me quite a bit of stress to do that alongside the writing, to do it alongside the covers, to do it alongside the Aquaman. So that's, like, that's quite pleased to get them finished. Um, that, I mean, that's yeah, a tough thing, really right? That's a, ultimately like, that's, that's the problem with all this is trying to bounce all of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard, you know? And the thing is, um, you know, sometimes you do get offered little things like I got offered uh, the Batman short for urban legends that I could write. And at the time I was like, I don't, I don't have time for this really. But I just couldn't turn that down. I couldn't turn down. I mean, it was only a short 10 pages, but, you know, just to write Batman for 10 pages and just tell a little short little story that I was going to draw, that that you, there's some things that you just can't turn down. And then you just, uh, I've got a very supportive wife, Catherine, and you just have to make it work and hope the kids are sleeping through at night so that you get at least a few hours. But, I mean, it, it's... I love what I do, um, you know, and I've got very supportive editors and thankfully, you know, I'm mostly on time and, and keep to my, mostly keep to my deadlines. And I think as long as you can mostly keep to your deadlines and, you, and you, you're always in contact, it always keeps the stress. I mean, the stress for me is that I think kind of like is the uncertainty. So as long as you keep the uncertainty at bay and people know that they can rely on you, you can kind of keep going, and I'm good at I'm good at saying no when I know I need to. Yeah. I got offered um I got offered a, an issue of uh, Immortal Hulk once, and it's like Immortal Hulk was like my God. I mean, I don't have to tell you just what an incredible book that is, and and to work with Al again, and I'm a big Hulk fan, and to turn that down was just painful. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it was so painful. But I just knew, I, you know, you have to put your health. And your and your family life and and everything first and um and it, and sometimes there's this weird sense of relief when you turn something down because it gives you a sense of if you can turn down something that you really want to do then you know you're in you know you're in charge and you're in control um and it's just having the confidence that those those offers are going to come again yeah uh, or if they don't something else just as good will so that's really how I've kind of always lived it. Um, I'll push myself as much as I can, but I know where my breaking point is and I know when I need to start saying no to things. I think that's a it's a very healthy perspective and it seems to be leading you to some great places because I think people are going to be really, they're going to love Bloodstained Teeth. I'm very excited for Aquaman Andromeda and everything else you have coming up. But Christian, that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on here to have this chat with me. I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh no, I've loved it, David. Thank you for having me. I've been wanting to come on for ages, so this has been fun. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with writer-artist Christian Ward. You can find him on Twitter at, at CJWardArt and his work in the upcoming Bloodstained Teeth and Image in Aquaman Andromeda at DC Black Label. Also, a quick note. 
If you thought this podcast sounded a little bit better than usual, that's because Deanna Chapman, who edited this podcast. Thanks for stepping in, Deanna. Love off panel want to support it? Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts today and give the show a rating or review while you're at it, but five stars only. You can also support the show by backing on Patreon. Find the show at patreon.com slash off panel. And when you back it on there, you get early access to each week's podcast as well as weekly content and more. Want even more? Subscribe to my subscription comic site, Sketched at Sketch.com for its long-form articles, interviews, and the rest of the site's content and its members-only form. You can find Off-Panel and Sketched on social media by liking it on Facebook at Slash Sketched. That's S-K-T-C-H-D. Follow it on Twitter and Instagram at, at @sketchcomic or following me at, at Slice Fried Gold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Cameron Brown, Rom V, Devin Fitzsimons, Nick Walker, Patrick Coyle, Isaac Warren, Scott Carpenter, Rent Narb Studios Comics, Nicholas Palmieri, Capes and Tights Podcast, Claus Van Deven, Brian, Submit Industries, Raj Patel, Jack Mulqueen, Kyle, Carl Kershaw, Robert Masella, Elza Chartier, Luke Nakashoji, Elliot Metz, Dr. Luke, Scott Hazelwood, Scott Buwan, Michael Tunk, Canadian by Proxy, Johnny Cannon, Bradley Raider, Carl Troy, Brandon DePillis, Patrick Brower, Declan Shalvey, Dan Garino, Josh Williamson, Adam Freeman, Ben Wild, Brian Klein Q, SB, Nick Ben. Bennett, Daniel Whitfield, Susanna Polo, Reed Hinkley Barnes, Mario Tiambang, AbductedTheComic.com, Andrew Carita, Matt Mahoney, Charlie Chu, Stephen Hall, Pensacola Pop Comics, Kim Eslam, Philip Myra, Christian Shelton, Kenny Porter, Chris Bacello, Torin Grunbeck, Fuzz Bubbles, Christopher Todd, Transmitter Down, Waltz Comics and Books, Carl Mizell, Paul Slates, Akil Wilson, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dodson, Wesley Giff, Sean Kirkham, Alistair Ross, Julio Anta, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Paul Reinwand, Vita Ayala, Tara Ferguson, Dave Slusher, WMQ Comics, Akil, Kokachi, Sean Pinello, Ken Heidelman, Philip Seavey, Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, David Kelly, Robert Wilson IV, Nick Polito, Brendan Fletcher, Jonathan Nilsson, Matthew Groom, Jason Assey, Adam Bogart, Matthew Taylor, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Baraldi, Nick Hall, Bjorn Basin, John Hendrick, Steve Anderson, Ian Maxwell, Cliff Chang, Colin McMahon, Chris Palmer, Scott McGovern, Nathan Fairbairn, Kat McKenzie, Adam Highfield, Fiona Staples, Mark Abnett, Mike Murphy, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Demonakos, Norbert, Nick Lowe, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics Star in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to Upright T-Rex Music, who wrote performed Off Panel's theme song just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode.